so I guess we'll get started. Um, so first I wanted to say that uh, Professor Dalby uh, informed me that it's, I mispronounced it yesterday, it's not GM, it's Jan, uh, which is his knowledge. So that's a uh, beautiful thing. Um, I wanted to relate that to you. Most of you know that I did not know that yesterday, so you might even want to make that, that, that correction. Um, yeah, welcome back in uh, third lecture of 10, so 20% done. And after this will be 30% done. Uh, and so today we'll talk about microbial size sort. So I guess I should start with a disclosure that I'm forced to do by my university because of conflict of interest. Uh, is a, a, a co-founder and scientific advisor to advanced microbial labs along some uh, part of the country. And so this company makes size selected bubbles using the same tool sort. So um, just realize that there is that uh, apparent conflict of interest um, there to be <clears throat> If you remember from yesterday, we talked about applications why we need to maintain a certain size distribution. Um, and we call that, we use bubbles for indigen, specifically molecular and uh, where we want to use the quantitative ability of micro bubbles. Um, and in order to, use, to be quantitative, we need to have a narrow size distribution. Also, drug and gene delivery. I, yesterday I introduced you to blood brain barrier opening. In fact, there's a big there, there are some clinical trials that are underway, and there's also a big debate in the community right now because there was a group at the NIH that uh, discovered that there was what they call a, uh, a non-infectious related uh, <coughs> inflammation response that they observed in animals that were treated bubbles in which they were doing. They call the sterile immune response, or SIR. Um, and they reported that in PNAS, Students uh, of the National Academy of Sciences in the US. And um, it raised a, a question whether the technique was safe, right? And so um, the, the team in Toronto that's doing the clinical trials went back and looked at the bubbles that they were using and, and said, well, you're using a dose that's 10 times higher than we're using. Um, and so this question of, of dose came, comes up, and it turns out that um, they use different bubbles. So the, the team at, uh, at the NIH uses uh, protein shell bubbles that are a little bit larger, and uh, the, the Toronto team uses liquid shell bubbles that are a little bit smaller. And so um, they tried to do these direct comparisons, but they can't do it very well because of the size distributions. And so this is a, a huge problem right now is not having uniform size distributions. It's literally come to a point where um, you know major groups are coming together or Dr. Warren's trying to determine whether it's safe and effective. We know that it can be safe and effective, the question is how can we make sure that it's always safe and effective? Because like any treatment you can use too high of a dose and you have problems. So we want to make sure we can avoid that. And bubble size selection is critically important for that. So recall I showed this same slide a number of times yesterday when we were talking about uh, how micro bubbles are found. And it's true for any kind of mechanical agitation technique. That mechanical agitation has two stages. The first stage is entrainment, in which you form these capillary layers that grow size and eventually pinch off the bubble. And that bubble becomes a to the liquid. And then there's a secondary stage in which shear forces or inertial forces emitting from cavitation, which is shear forces, can impinge on the bubble and the bubble will break down. It will break continue to break down into smaller and smaller broader bubbles until the surface forces and inertial forces are balanced. Um, and that leads to, to distributions of uh, large bubbles, at least in the three, typically on a scale of millimeters to hundreds of microns, and then tens of microns down to microns, even sub microns. 
So we, we always get these quality dispersed suspensions, which is why all the commercial agents are quality dispersed, all the ones which are the approved agents. <coughs> so uh, we need some way to refine the size of the commercial. And one way is to just make, uh, use micro annuity techniques to make uniform sizes to begin with. Okay? And we'll talk about that later today. Another way to be more practical and economical is to take the quality dispersed suspension and to refine that. That will be also a topic of the practical The first method um, is probably the simplest method to implement, which is centrifuge. Uh, a couple more techniques have been developed, and this really comes from a group at the University of Puerto Physics and Group, led by Joe Bershaw's, well, he's been on that, and he's still in this particular model of the branch of the research there. So one method is called a crystal radiation force, where you're pushing the bubbles and then separate them based on how well they uh, interact with ultrasounds and push by the ultrasound. Pinch flow fractionation. This is a hydrodynamic technique. Uh, it doesn't require any external fields like centralization and crystal radiation force. And so these are the three main um, models that we'll look at in this lecture. Okay, so we'll start with simplification. This is what we're going to do in practical today. And I'll start with uh, just showing you some size distributions that we have. These are typical size distributions that you can find uh, for fresh batch of bubbles. First, uh, I should point that the size distribution that you get will depend on the instrument that you're using to measure it. Okay? So there, not all instruments, each instrument has its advantages and weaknesses. But, so you've got to be aware of that, but not all of our perfectly accurate. They have different principles of operation and therefore they're more sensitive, they're sort of sensitive to certain things. The multi-sizer is made by a vacuum filter. It's a method that involves, you know, you have an electrolyte solution that passes through, <coughs> passes into a chamber through an orifice. And there are electrodes on both sides of the chamber. And so there's a capacitance that, or a, let's say, resistance that's through that uh, orifice. The flow fluid is flowing through that orifice. When a microbubble comes through, it displaces some of the electrolyte solution and leads to a change in the resistance, increase in the resistance, which is proportional to the volume of the particles or the volume of the volume. So it's called, we call it electro zone sensing. And it's based on electrical appearance or, or resistance. And it's really the bubble volume that you can measure. And then you can get the bubble size if you could produce it as a sphere. I, in my opinion, uh, this is the most accurate technique out there. But it also is not easy to implement. You have to buy a special electrolyte solution that's specifically engineered to, for the agriculture. Um, so we wind up buying a lot of this. Right, which is working for it, which is not very practical in this line of work. They call it isotones because it's isotonic with the cells because the technique was originally developed for cell counting. We don't need that in bubbles. We don't need to have a fancy isotonic solution. Uh, but I think it's the most accurate um, because it's not subject to the same kind of artifacts that, you, um, that the light based techniques are, and I'll show you here in a bit. Um, I should say that uh, the multi sizer is also sort of laborious to use. So you have to make a little too bad full of the same isotone solution. You inject your bubbles and then you have to stir them. There's, no auto, there's not a very good auto stir. Um, and so it's subject to your bubble flotation and things like that. So it's still, it's still not a perfect technique, but it seems to do a pretty good job at least of an accurate solution, even if it's not high speed. Um, one thing to notice is that when you take a polydispersed bubble suspension, you'll get different size distributions from the same data, depending on how you plot the data. Most people plot the number of weighted uh, concentration versus diameter, or the number of weighted size distribution. Um, and that typically, that tends to, uh, to favor the smaller particles in the suspension. You can also weight it as the volume weighted distribution. And now, 
since um, you know volume goes as R cube, it tends to link the distribution towards large dynamics. So you're getting a very big difference in the number of distribution versus the volume of distribution. And so with polymers, it's applied dispersity index. I think it's more valuable to to gain the polymer dispersity index by by some kind of a ratio of these two weighted dia median diameters versus um, a percent of the standard deviation for the mean or something like that. Because these aren't uh, Gaussian distributions. Uh, these tend to be not Gaussian, but maybe log level distributions. So I think that, it, that you need to, if you want to make a model dispersion suspension, you need to show that the volume weighted and number weighted distributions are essentially You take that same batch of bubbles and now you size them with the equisizer, you get a different size. Um, you get this peak around one to two micron, another one in the four to five micron range, six to eight microns, and so on. And these peaks, if you plot them versus volume weighted distribution, you see these peaks come out in the more color. You can uh, compare the two, so you have the exerciser and the multi-sizer. And on one occasion, we took uh, a, a particular sample that had been size selected, where we had done some simplification of it, and we saw that it appeared to be two bumps on the, the multi-sizer that appeared to correspond with the exerciser. And this, this, this is one of those mistakes that we made. It was a mistake that we made early on to just think that there was a multimodal distribution. It was actually a happy accident because it led us to think, well, if, there, if it's multimodal, if these peaks are real, then why don't we just separate these peaks, right? The way you would, for example, polymers, um, which was a good thing. But it turned out that we, this, this just happened to be one batch that showed this kind of bimodal distribution. Two, two peaks, but it's not always necessarily the case. Okay? We got further fooled when we did this other experiment, where we took um, some micro bubbles that, that were larger, we had done some centralization to estimate larger bubbles, and then we pressurized them for a certain period of time. And we did flow cytometry. And the flow cytometry, one of the things that's interesting with flow cytometry is we get this measure of Okay, forward versus size scattered. Now you need, you need this with when you have a cell suspension because you need to figure out what are the neutrophils, what are the red blood cells, et cetera. You need to isolate cell types. But when you do this with bubbles, you get this really interesting characteristic pattern called the certainty pattern, where the, um, it, it bends back upon itself. It's not sort of a monotonic increase in forward versus side scatter, but it, it rather bends back on itself. It's a really peculiar. Um, Display that was very reproducible. You can see it on all kinds of different scattering devices. Well, we, uh, we, we pressurized this bubble, so it started at 7 to 8 microns. And then we pressurized it, and then, it's, and then we got this group of bubbles that moved down to 4 or 5 microns. And then we pressurized it again, and we got this group of bubbles that, that, that moved down to almost 2 microns. And so this again, we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, there's definitely a, a group of bubbles here in this size range, a group of bubbles in this size range, and another in this size range. It must be a multimodal size distribution. But instead, we, we actually forced this to be multimodal because we were pressurizing the bubbles and, and a fraction of those bubbles were shrinking down to a new size. It wasn't that we were generating a multimodal fashion. So again, this is an experiment that fooled us in believing that the multimodal size distribution. Was, was prevalent. Here's some more exercise we did. We start with large bubbles, we pressurize them, see this peak grow, pressurize them some more, another a smaller peak grows, uh, at the expense of these larger peaks, widens the smaller peak grows, and we continue to pressurize them in multiple stages. Um, 
so again, this was leading us to believe that we still had more than we really was. Question? We put them in the syringe, and then we cap, we capped it, and we, uh, we measured the measured the uh, the pressure. We had to check out the pressure here, so we just press on the on the uh, the plunger of the syringe until we reached a pressure of about two five hundred kilopascal, and then uh, we would wait for thirty seconds and go back and do another size. So each. Uh, sort of step function of pressure that we would experience. And in fact, it was really the step function that we're measuring, the step function would cause a, 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 for some reason, bubbles are like this, a subfraction will move. The whole population never moves together, but a subfraction moves with these pressurizations. It's kind of interesting the way that works. We don't know exactly why that is. Yeah. I think the pressure is uniform here, yeah, but I think um, there. I think what it comes down to is there is a fracture strength, uh, and so when you pressurize them, only a fraction of the bubbles um, have a, a, the strength that's below that threshold. So we just happen to be in a sweet spot here where we're, uh, we're getting just a fraction. I think if we would increase the pressure, then all the bubbles would. It's just a fraction of that kind of uh, mechanical integrity that can survive that versus those that are going to the rest. I think that that's probably the explanation. Does that make sense? We're pressurizing the bubbles because we're thinking that we're trying to see if this multi bubble size expression is correct. And what I'm doing is I'm showing you the state. So, in retrospect, we have the same question like, why did we? Approach it this way, but we're, we're thinking, we're just thinking, is this some kind of inherent property of the bubbles that they form multi bubbles? And the problem is, we kind of set up an experiment that allowed us to be tricked into believing that they were because it gave us results that seem to be consistent with the multi bubble size expectation. Um, again, here we show these are these um, characteristic plots, forward versus side scatter, and um, you can see that we start with these large bubbles and then with multiple cycles they, they move down, but they seem to be concentrating in this region, which again indicates a multimodal size situation. So we were convinced at the time, multimodal size situation, okay, so let's just capture those sizes. We have one to two, four to five, and six to eight microns. So let's just capture those sizes using the centrifugation technique. <coughs> so the idea was take the syringe and cap it so that fluid can't move out. And then uh, you can put it in a uh, swing bucket motor uh, centrifuge. And as this thing spins, it will move the, uh, will, well, as they spin the centrifugal force, initially they're, 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 they're pointed down, but the swing is then they move out as they're spinning. And so the tip of the syringe moves out for the periphery and the plunger moves in towards uh, the center. And this uh, creates a buoyancy gradient, uh, which allows us to collect the bubbles. So the fluid, the fluid actually gets pushed, the water gets pushed down through a centrifugal force. And so that leads to the buoyancy of the bubbles rising up. Now there's different uh, potential mechanisms. Well, there's, there's different things that are affecting the bubble migration of the column is thermal diffusion, uh, which, uh, which could lead to, leads to randomization of the size distribution throughout, throughout the, the vessel. And there's also the bubbles are rising, they experience a buoyancy force and a viscous drag that are causing this movement. Okay, but the idea is simple. You just centrifuge the larger bubbles rise faster than smaller bubbles, so therefore you uh, create a cage with larger bubbles and then have what we call incremating for the smaller bubbles. Capture the smaller bubbles or the larger bubbles and put them in the water. Okay, the idea is start with the polymer's first suspension, you centrifuge, everything's rising up, but the larger bubbles rise faster. 
um, just form a team on the top, and then we can provide the information to the more smaller models and we're going to take the two more larger models. Remember that the bubbles are spherical bubbles, so we can recapture these bubbles even if they're in phase, we can resuspend them. That's an important part. Yeah, so the bigger bubbles are as faster. <coughs> we can occasionally incremate. So the bubble rise velocity, there's um, two force variables of the buoyancy force, the X on the bubble. It's given by the difference in the density of the fluid compared to that gravity, or uh, sorry, of the, of the gas. So this is the liquid medium, this is the gas density. The gas density is only less than a percent of the fluid density, so you can even just uh, that goes to zero essentially. Times the gravitational force times the volume of the, of the level of the sphere, four thirds pi r t. And you, so the buoyancy force is causing the bubble to accelerate, but then there's also a drag force that's acting against the acceleration of the bubble, and that increases the velocity. So at some point, uh, you have a constant force, and then this force increases until it reaches a velocity at which the drag force is equivalent to the buoyancy force. And so you can easily determine what that is by, it might be this one. Okay, I apologize for that delay. Okay, so we have a buoyancy force that's constant, it's dependent on the volume and the, the, the gravitational force, and you have a drag force that increases with increasing velocity. This drag force is given by Stokes drag. It's for um, very, very low rates of uh, drag on a bubble. On a bubble, or actually it's on a solid particle, but a bubble is like a solid particle because it has surfactant. And very low is low, so it acts like a solid particle. It doesn't have any dissonance. So it acts like a solid particle. So this is the correct expression. So we set these forces equal at the terminal velocity v, and then we solve for the terminal velocity v, which becomes 2 over 9 on gravitational acceleration times the difference in density times the difference. Uh, divided by the dynamic viscosity of the of the fluid times um, the radius of the bubble squared. And so what do you notice here? Well, it's the velocity is continually increasing with gravity, and it's increasing with the square of the radius. So larger bubbles move much faster than smaller bubbles. So here's velocity versus centrifugal force. So you can determine, okay, if I have a length, a path length of a certain size that I need the bubbles to tra travel through, and I have a certain amount of time in the centrifuge, centrifuge for that gives me my terminal velocity. I then take that terminal velocity and then that gives me the relative centrifugal, centrifugal force to use. Or vice versa, if you take the relative centrifugal force of say 100, okay, that gives, that gives me a velocity of maybe about 0 0.21, 0 0.0021, meters per second, so you don't need the length of your syringe, so you can get more than the length of time of centrifugation. So um, a couple things to say about that. First of all, the bubble acceleration and deceleration are not common, are, are basically very, very fast because the loop, because it's, it's water, they're very small particles of water, very low Reynolds number. There's not much inertia, it's more of a diffusion than uh, inertia. So, um, the, and I've done the calculations before, so the acceleration is a fraction of a millisecond or something like that. 
speed up and slow down. There is time that the machine takes to speed up to a certain RPM and then to slow down. Uh, it's not instantaneous. So there is some excel, there is basically a changing velocity as, as the gravity increases and the gravity drops down. So that's something we can see in the process. Um, another thing to think about is the Heckling number. So I mentioned to you that there's also diffusion. So you want to know what degree is diffusion, what's the role of diffusion going to play in this versus buoyancy driven sedimentation, but we're moving, it's a, it's a buoyant mode. So you can do that with a Peckley number. Peckley number is uh, a ratio of the convection over the diffusion. So the, the convection rate is given by the rise velocity of the bubble in the, in the gravitational field, we just saw. And saw. <clears throat> the diffusion rate is given as, uh, the rate is given as B diffusion coefficient over 2R. So B diffusion coefficient is a meter squared per second. So divided by R in meters is the meters per second at the velocity. You're dividing two velocities, so you get a universal number, Heckler number. So you substitute in uh, these two terms, and you get T times R times B over T, the diffusion coefficient. The diffusivity, uh, this is Einstein's relation, and um, I haven't checked this, but I, I heard that this is true that actually Einstein's paper where he did this. Uh, Coefficient is cited more often in this theory of relativity paper or something like that. I heard this at some point. It's extremely useful to know this, right? This is a uh, kT chemical energy over six pi mu times r. Uh, and r is the size of, of the particle. So the larger the particle is the lower the diffusion coefficient. Right? So you can substitute this in. Um, we already determined velocity, and now we have a term for the diffusion coefficient. So you just you substitute all that in, and then you simplify, and you get the Peckley number is eight divided by three times pi times the gravitational acceleration, which you can set right for for the centrifugation, times the change in, in densities of the difference of densities that is between the bubble and the helium divided by kc times r to the fourth. So a very strong part of dependence on particle size. So if you plot that for a one micron bubble versus centrifugal force, it's easy to see that even at 100 centrifugal force for a very small bubble, one micron, you're still 2,000, you're effective about 2,000, which means that convection or buoyancy driven velocity is 2,000 times more than diffusion. Okay? So diffusion is minimal compared to, the random diffusion is minimal compared to the, the buoyancy driven separation. And you get and that becomes more and more apparent as you increase the relative centrifugal force. The relative centrifugal force, that's how many g's you have. Okay? So that's a unit of g's, not for the meters per second squared. So the idea was then to take these multimodal distributions, use these equations to calculate if you, use, if you, add, if you put these in a centrifuge, we have a certain syringe height. We have a certain centrifugation side uh, as speed. Um, we can we can centrifuge these bubbles at least up to 300 Gs without breaking them. Um, they, they appear to be stable at least 300 Gs. Uh, then we use that to size them, and so that's that's what we did. So one to two, four, five, six, eight microns. This is the uh, accuracy measurements. And the beautiful thing was. We, when we did this, we could see a nice correlation between the number weight distribution and the bottom weight distribution. They don't overlap each other exactly, but that's this this is what we're looking for. This is a, what we think is a, what we would call a model dispersed suspension. One in which the volume weighted diameter is about the same as the number weighted diameter. Okay. Median diameter or average diameter. I prefer a median diameter. Because it's not, as you can see, it's not always a Gaussian distribution. If it was Gaussian, it would be the same. Um, and the nice thing is we can achieve relative, you know, recorded volumes on the order of milliliters, useful for contrast aging injections. Concentrations on the order for contrast, for, for contrast aging injections, so 10 to 9 microns per mL. It only takes one or two hours to do that, 
And those bubbles are stable over several days. It turns out over several weeks, they're stable. So we published this uh, back in 2009 in a paper called My Total Size Estimation by the differential set of percentage deviation. Differential just being that they have different body velocities in their size. So the size of the bubble, the rise velocity of the bubble depends on the square of its radius, and you can use that to separate. Um, if you look at the bubbles under the scope, there's far dispersed, but then when you size select them, you get what appears to be. So this is always the first thing to test is no one under the microscope, are they actually the same size? This is the, the ground truth really, is when you're looking at it, when you see them. Um, so these are the larger bubbles, these are the smaller bubbles. <clears throat> so this was the initial polymer's first size distribution versus the size estimate distribution. So number weighted distribution, block weighted distributions. And here's the four to five microns, number weighted distribution. So basically demonstrating that you can do this, and again, still under the belief that it's a multimodal size distribution. So we're, we're just, we're, there's these, these populations already exist at these distinct sizes that we're just collecting. So we obviously would get cutoffs that were based on this, the size distribution. But it turns out that that um, was an artifact of measurement, and um, they aren't in fact multimodal. And so we, we later came back and published a paper back in 2014, so six years later, where we found out exactly why what we saw was an artifact, and why the bubbles are not multimodal, as we thought they were. Where this multimodality is an artifact that comes in, because of the nonlinear acoustic, acoustic uh, sorry, optical phenomenon. So uh, this is just a data showing light obscuration of the exerciser. It's based on light, um, the, the, the diffraction and reflection of light by the bubble. Electrozone sensing is based on this, on this um, well, it's a multi sizer so I already described that. And then there's, you can actually calculate the distinction, the light distinction coefficient of the bubble based on the strand of the bubble. And so this is a, and this is a, a bubble that was size selected that was in the four, up to four micron diameter range. And we measured it here with the multi sizer. So we, in the multi sizer, we see a mono, uh, a, a suspension that's not, it's not uh, bimodal, it's mono mobile. It's got a single peak. And this curve is a theoretical extinction. And the extinction, the extinction curve doesn't go up as diameter squared, like, like uh, you would normally think for a scatterer. But because of the size of the particle, it's on micron size scale, the light, the wavelength of light is about half of a micron, and the size of the beam waves of the laser that's impinging on the bubble in the geometry of the optics. Uh, optical detectors, it turns out that the extinction coefficient actually has this kind of nonlinear behavior. It increases sharply when it flattens out, and it increases sharply when it flattens out, and it increases sharply when it flattens out. The effect of that is that, is that over a certain diameter range in the flat region, you're not getting much of a change in the co-extinction. So in this region, and in this region, and this region. And what that does is it tends to bend particles into certain diameter sizes. Even though you, you have bubbles that are continuous along this, this line, because of this bending phenomenon, you wind up getting, you can, uh, it's, it's not linear phenomenon, it bends these bubbles into certain sizes. And so the, the actual size distribution comes out as a, as a multimodal distribution. Okay. So this is the true distribution, but this is the artifact. Uh, and, and you can predict this um, so we use polymer microbeads, which we knew their size, so we use the two techniques. And we got reasonable uh, sizes for both of those particles because they were a lot of dispersed particles. But we use those to measure the forward scatter um, and the size scatter for the four cytometer. So these were just these were just calibration errors. And then we went back and used the mean theory, the scattering theory. And we actually calculated 
what the side, corn scatter versus side scatter should be based on um, our some uh, calibration failures that we're following with these. And lo and behold, it predicts pretty well the serpentine behavior of the, of the polymers in the course of the So again, this is just a, a sort of nonlinear acoustical, uh, sorry, not acoustical, uh, optical phenomenon that's leading to what appears to be discrete sizes and different sizes of the So again, like I said, it, we, were, we got tricked. We made a mistake. We got tricked into believing they were multimodal size distributions. It was a happy accident because it led us to think, well, why don't we separate those? Which led to differential centrifugation, which now we do have, in fact, size distributions that are uh, dispersed. But understanding that phenomenon is not a problem of measurement technique. Now, in my lab, we still use the exercise all the time because the exercise still gives with accurate, average, mean, and mean value. Believe it or not, even with these peaks, it still gives you an accurate concentration and mean diameter. It's got an auto dilution function, and it, uh, it, it it's really easy to run. It's got auto refill, auto flush. So you, you literally put in the sample, you do a measurement, and then the whole thing will refresh itself while you're doing your experiment. You can come back and do the next measurement. So it's much easier to use in terms of the workflow of the lab, it's much faster. Uh, to use the exercise, but when we need a really, really accurate size distribution, we'll go with the filter feature. We need the whole size distribution to be accurate. But uh, the exercise is very, very good for size and uh, average size and concentration. Okay, so um, any questions about that? That's kind of information on centrifugal sorting, and you're going to get some hands on experience with that today. Well, so, uh, you're going to see a the more, uh, it's sort of an art form for visual learning, so um, it takes a while to get used to. So the, the finer uh, <coughs> separations will be shown to you, and then you get a chance to do some more simple separations. Yes. If they're in nano range, let them target by having the Yeah. Yes, um, what, what's limiting is the Peckler number. So as long as you get your Peckler number high enough and you can wait long enough, then, you, then your particles should be separate. Yeah. What we found is that uh, the sub-micron fraction just doesn't tend to be very stable compared to the micron size fraction. So um, if you're centrifuging for a long time with those sub-micron bubbles, you can get them, but they're just not as stable. So um, if you wanted to, to make them and store them, and use them in an experiment a week later or two weeks later, it becomes problematic. So you can size select, but you sort of have to do it right before the experiment, which makes it harder. Like, uh, if you're a bubble making lab, you can do it. But if you're not, if you're a lab that's more biological in scope and doesn't have all the equipment to do that, it can be far more problematic. But the nice thing is, um, you, need, you have to have a good particle count to do size select. But a centrifuge is very ubiquitous in laboratories, is pretty much. Right? Chemistry and biological laboratories always have. There must be a, a centrifuge around somewhere. So, um, yeah. And it turns out um, you don't necessarily need to have an accelerator or multi size. You can do flow cytometry. You have to, it doesn't give you absolute values. You have to be careful with it. But you can use a flow cytometer. And those are often ubiquitous in bio biology departments and immunology departments. So you can often find those really problematic. Okay, the next technique is acoustic radiation flows. The idea here um, is that you're going to take advantage of a force that's at the level, it's called the acoustic radiation force, or the primary, specifically the primary acoustic radiation force, that's going to be pushing on a bubble because of the interaction of the bubble with both sides. And so this is a, I like this picture because it really demonstrates that the bubble is oscillating. It's a street image, so it's lined out of center, smeared out over time. And you see the center, the center of the diameter of the bubble changing as a function of time, but also the center of the bubble is moving. And that translation is the acoustic radiation force. So Michelle Burstaus and Tim Seegers, uh, who was a student at the time, decided to use this technique to sort ultrasound contrasters or microphones. And this is a paper that we're going to um, 
Do some public posting. So it was back in uh, 2004, 2005. Sorry, 2014. And the concept is is this, you have these bubbles that are coming out uh, in a microfluidic device. So you have these polydispersed bubbles that are coming into this device and they're moving here. And normally they would just follow the streamline in the middle and they would come out of this part of the chamber. There's, um, there's a little separator here. So this, this goes to one tube, this goes to another tube, this goes to another tube, and so on. So the acoustic wave is pushing back, but if the bubble experiences a lot of acoustic radiation force, it will move up into this other collection channel. And then you can uh, collect these bubbles um, and they'll be isolated. And the interesting thing about acoustic radiation force is it's very size dependent. And you get the maximum acoustic radiation force at the resonant frequency of the bubble. And even more than, remember these scattering curves where you saw the big peak at the residence and then it comes down and then it comes back up again? We saw that last lecture. Well, in the radiation force, it goes up and then it comes back down, it almost comes back down to zero. So it's a very nice cube that will select a very narrow range of bubble sizes. So they built this. Uh, this system, there's a flow flow, flow 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 focusing, and then the gas. So I started with flow focusing. These are microfluidic bubbles. So they're monodispersed to begin with. So they started with monodispersing just to test the system. And then they have acoustic radiation force that's pushing the bubbles. And you can see that the bubbles are pushed uh, up to here. So just, just so that things are clear. So it's a demonstration that it works on monodispersed bubbles. Then they went and tested it on polydispersed bubbles. So they, there was the both models, and they went into the ultrasound contrast. In this case, they used um, this agent that they get from Bracco, which is a company that sells almost a sun on them. But they're using, I think, a propylopentane filled in. So it's an experimental unit. It's polydispersed in size, just like all bubbles that are made by mechanical methods. And so you get um, some big bubbles, small bubbles, medium sized bubbles. And they're flowing, and then they get sheathed by the code flow, so they're just moving out here in a, in a, in a bubble train. And then a, a acoustic radiation force is applied, and you can see that it, it displaces a bubble. So you can collect those bubbles that get displaced, Collect those bubbles, and uh, and so these are the dots. So this is the size distribution, or sorry, the, this is the size versus displacement. So they measure the displacement, and they see a nice peak in displacement that corresponds to the size, to the resonant size of the bubbles. Okay, so they're just proving a proof of concept that it works. This particular case, it's two megahertz. Okay, so the advantage of this technique is you, you're actually ba basing the separation of the acoustic properties of the bubble. So recall that there are differences in the elasticity. Even bubbles of the same size and the same composition can have different elasticities due to different micro structures. Okay? So you always have a distribution. And this is a way to select like bubbles that have the same resonant frequency, essentially, or similar resonant frequency. So it's based on acoustic properties instead of size or something like that. It tends to work very well with size, but, um, but it's based on acoustic properties. So that's one of the main advantages. Um, this is a, a relatively peak, tight peak, so that's a nice size distribution. Um, the problem with the technique is that there's also a, another force called the secondary radiation force. And the secondary radiation force is when two bubbles are oscillating in phase, they feel a hydrodynamic force that causes them to feel an attraction. So they'll actually be attracted to each other and they'll cluster. That happens when you have bubbles that are at too high color concentration. So you have, um, you have to dilute down the bubbles in this case to do this kind of, of measurement. 
to do this kind of separation. So it's not as fast as like as centrifugation because you have you have to dilute the bubbles down and then you have to deconcentrate. So it takes quite a while. And it's also somewhat challenging to build a device that gives you precisely the separation. And with most microcoding devices, you have to do it in a very thin facility because a little piece of dust can clog the channel and render that device no longer operational. So, so these are the problems with all this. So, any questions with acoustic radiation cores? I mean, there's other ways to utilize this course, right? There's probably other ways to design systems, processing systems that utilize this course for separations. It's just that um, not too many researchers have explored it yet, but I think it's a vital field. Yeah. 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 Nice if they would have tried some higher frequencies like five megahertz or seven megahertz. So I think that still may be technically challenging to do that. You start to get about smaller and smaller bubble sizes. Um, so maybe farther and farther into the So I think the would be smaller. Yeah, higher frequency would be smaller bubbles. Yeah. So larger bubbles you want to reduce that frequency and try to have smaller bubbles you use higher frequency. Any questions on radiation force? So, they use the one that's called Rapto, I think it's called BR14. It's an experimental agent, it's not, it's not an FDA approved agent, um, but it's from a company called Rapto, B R A C C O. They do a lot of the bubble uh, manufacturing, uh, particularly for Europe, the European groups often. Uh, they're one of the few companies that make bubbles that that would share their agent with researchers. <laughs> so what you'll find is that um, the companies that own many of these contrasting they, they're not too they're not too generous uh, to share their agent. Even if you want to buy them, they require you to have a MD or something like that. So you have to purchase it. Um, and they don't seem to be interested in just giving you free vials, except for the BRACO team. The BRACO, particularly for the European groups, has often been providing their researchers with free one test agents. So they've been a lot more generous. Is this the company you say Sony? Yeah, no, it's not exactly the same. It's not the same as Definity either. It's closer to Definity. It's got, I think it's got uh, uh, peripheral butane as the gas core. Uh, the, so you has SF6 and uh, the Infinity has peripheral propylene as their two so, so it's closer than the Infinity, but um, it's more stable. It's actually closer to Endovist, um, uh, Sonozoid. Sonozoid is the peripheral Infinity. Okay, another method. That, so Tim and, and Michelle were prolific, and you'll, you're going to see them a lot today. So they also published this paper uh, in this uh, journal lab on chip uh, on flow, flow frac pitch flow fraction. Now, I should say the technique was originally, um, you know, was originally introduced by a Japanese team, so Masumi uh, Yamada, in 2004. They had this as one of the first type of studio.
the same phenomenon. That's really fascinating. So, again, it's a wide open field. Uh, this is really the pioneering paper in use of the bubbles. It was only published a couple of years ago. So, it's a uh, kind of wide open Okay, so that is a quick overview of the three methods of segregation of history and historical fractionation. So are there any questions on any of the three of those techniques? So if you're interested in those techniques, those elastic techniques, the segregation force and cash flow, I recommend you read those papers by Michelle Verstappen. They're really very nice size and, and give a lot of good development details of physics and how they work. Okay, good. Well, um, I guess we have a break now. And then if you have questions, if, uh, feel free to come up and talk to me during the break. Okay, thank you.
the solid solid interaction to solid solvent interaction and the solvent solvent interactions associated with fluid that molecule in the salt the solute here is liquid, the solvent molecules are water, and actually the main contribution here is going to be a solvent to solvent interaction. So it's going to be that this molecule has to uh, that we have to form a cavity in the liquid water. We have to disrupt hydrogen bonds and form a cavity in the water to allow this molecule to exist. So this will look like I'll go over here. So if we have this liquid molecule, in order to dissolve this in water, we have to create a cavity in the water. And we have to we essentially have to break all these hydrogen bonds that are between the water molecules in order to create that cavity. So the self energy will be Reduced, or they, they, the um, that energy will be reduced as a molecule joins up the monolayer or joins a micelle because once it does that, it's no longer interacting with water, so that cavity is So typically, that self energy will be much less in aggregate state than it will be in the monomer state. So there's that self energy, and then there's also um, the Boltzmann term, which is KT. N times Ln of the mole fraction of molecules in the aggregates divided by the molecules per aggregate. And that will be the chemical potential at the limit of minimal thermal density equilibrium is constant. Uh, so that it's e that will be equal to A equals 1, which is a monomer situation, A equals 2, which is a dimer, 3, which is a trimer, so on and so forth, until A gets very large. So we'll just compare the, the case where N is N, is for N very large, and then we'll compare the two monomer cases in this one. So that's the self energy of a monomer solution that includes the entire cavity energy of the, the, the liquid molecule in the water, plus AT. And then, so the thing is equal to once this is And uh, in sense, what we do is we, we have this equation and we equate these two terms and we um, can solve for x of n. So x of n is equal to n times x to the 1. Exponential of the self energy of the monomer minus the self energy of a monomer that's in the micelle over the Boltzmann constant times the temperature, and then that whole quantity is raised to the power of 10. So we have that in right there. And so that's the wrong one. It's the other. That's going to be the concentration of liquid molecules, the mole fraction actually, of liquid molecules that are in uh, monomers. And we apply a constraint here that it's a mole fraction, so it's not C1. And we can apply that here. So if we apply that in the problem uh, above to this equation, then we get uh, X sub 1. Exponential of uh, again the self energy of the monomer solution minus the self energy of the monomer in of the liquid in the micelle um, has to be less than and this is one over n to the power of one over n. And um, this term right here, as n goes to infinity. That term goes uh, goes to one. So, so that this term here is approximately or one because that goes to infinity. And so then what we'll do is we'll split this apart so we'll get x one comes in on the left hand side. And it has to be less than or equal to generally we say less than or equal to um, exponential actually one over the exponential of this term, so we put a negative sign here. Okay, 
So this is just saying that it's a more fraction. And x1, what we see is x1 cannot exceed this term. And so when it, this term here potentially gives us our critical mass of concentration, or actually our mole fraction. I'm going to use this, this term here because we're going to uh, give the CMCs the values of molars, moles per liter, molar area. And uh, right now it doesn't give the mole fraction, so we'll say x sub CMC. So what this is saying is as you, as you add more and more of uh, the monomer, in this case liquid, uh, the monomer solution, the monomer concentration solution, that is, the molecules that are dissolved, the single molecules cannot exceed that, that value. So the exponential, uh, the difference in self energy is divided by the density. That's, 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 that's our, that's the critical mass of concentration, and it's equal to exponential gradient. And really, the only thing that we're using first principles here we're just assume it's, it's, uh, it's as simple as you have said, the equilibrium, the both of these position applies. And um, n equals uh, of some very large number. And, uh, and we're using the Gibbs uh, chemical potential. So, so this is really a first principle derivation of the CMC. So that's the CMC, and then we box this to go a little bit later. Um, and now we'll consider the case where we have a gas bubble in liquid water. So it's out here, so it's 
So it's going to gain energy. Obviously, thermal dynamics is really interesting to the individual molecules being at the interface. Um, so delta E is, is the activation energy. This is part two. Um, yeah, not too much. So I have to just got a second here to get it to go. And uh, part two. Um, all right, so, so last time we saw that delta E is the activation of energy, um, the kinetic energy of the residual solar plunge gets doubled with it. Therefore, uh, the probability of a collision resulting in a lipid leaving the monomer and going into the, the bulk of the water is e to the negative. Delta E for that activation energy will be T. Obviously, the higher the temperature, the more likely you are to overcome the energy barriers. And um, one of the key insights that comes from this neurosability is that that delta energy is equal to um, the difference in the self energy, the monomer, minus, so that's the final state, minus the initial state, which is the, in the uh, in the aggregate. Okay, so here we're going to assume that um, that we can use, well, this is going to be uh, I guess valid in the case of a monomer going zone. We're also going to compare this to an ISO experiment for the sake of comparison. So, so then when we plug that in, we'll go to E to the negative. Self energy in monomer, that's the self energy. And then the rate, so this is the and then the rate of molecules leaving that rate is going to be equal to the collision rate. Times the probability of uh, collision resulting in a lipid being expelled. Okay. And we can take the inverse of that to the time. We'll take the inverse. So now the rate, instead of taking the inverse of the resonance time, and then the collision rate, um, the inverse of that is the characteristic time between collisions. And then divided by the difference in self energy and the energy. And then we recognize that uh, CMC concentration is equal to. And then we can um, plug that in and we can get tau to the model to the expand. Not divided by the <coughs> But here the CMC is in the mole fraction. So to get past the CMC in the molarity, which is what we need, we'll have to take the measurements of moles of liquid over moles of water. So we'll have to take that terms. Uh, we use the molecular weight to get the grams of water, the grams of water, the mole of water, and uh, I'll take the density of the water. So it's one gram of water is in one milliliter, one gram of water is in one milliliter, one gram of water is in one milliliter, milliliters per liter. And then, so that in order to get 
the CNC, which has in its uh, walls of liquid for meter of water, that's going to be foreseeable. CNC wall power stream runs 15, and I think it'll go. And so we can then plug that back in, and it runs this time. There's one of the CMC. The CMC is in uh, most of our leader companies. And so that's the equation relating the residence time of the liquid in the layer, in this case, the of my cell, to the, uh, the, the CMC, which you can measure in this room for these different types of liquids. All right, I'll stop it there. Um, does everybody follow that innovation pretty well? Uh, is everybody here? So, this is the residence time of liquid, of liquid in the aggregate, which would be a micellar would be the liquid bottle And this should be tau naught. I think Greg has a video out there for tau naught. This is some characteristic collision <laughs> frequency, or time between collisions, actually. Um, and that depends. You know, that depends on the jump of the system, the concentration of liquid, et cetera. So um, we can kind of find ways to derive that, but typically that's that's time experimentally. Um, this is just the number of the number of the CMC. So what, what you can do is you can take the ratio of CMCs for two different lipids, and that will give you the ratio of resonance times. So if you wanted to look at the ratio of resonance time for Hey, but you can heard that of B to the C, you take the CMC of B to the C over the CMC of A B. And uh, I think you get something like 10 to the third is the difference in, is the factor of the difference in CMCs. So that's that's the basic idea. That's why in principle Hegwitten should be depleted from the liquid model layer faster than B to the C if if you have oscillations that are helping to facilitate the, the loss of the liquid trace. So that was the basic idea behind that. Does everybody understand that? From a chemical engineer perspective, that's a good sort of thing to sort of normal chemical kinetics and other things. Good? Okay. All right, so I guess we'll wrap it up there. And I think it's just about finished. Start with the lab session at three. Let me check the production setting. Still getting it ready, so if you have any questions, you can ask questions. Does everybody understand that concept of self energy? It's, um, so, typically, when we take chemical engineering from the dynamics, we learn about standard chemical potential. Um, I think what's beautiful about, and that, that's always been mysterious to me, but what's interesting about Israel Australia is he says that's the Self energy. And self energy is uh, a combination of all the interactions that are happening solute solute, like liquid liquid, solute solvent, liquid water, solvent solvent interactions, water water interactions, all those how all those interactions change when you go from, from one state to another state. Um, and so I think it's it's kind of a nice way to think about it. Um, that's, that's the underlying principle behind the, the CMC and the resonance time. Good. Are you ready to make bubbles and size selectors? <laughs> I think they're already made for this day, so um, we'll see this with the size selectors. Remember, it's a, maybe I should go back to that equation. It's a relatively simple, straightforward equation for the rise velocity of a bubble.
It does, but it's happening before you can see it. I mean, it's happening fast, basically. And so, in fact, it happens fast on the, on the microfluidic device as well, but it's, it's really easy to image on what's happening on the microfluidic device. But it's going to have to be happening during the generation of bubbles. Um, the problem is that the difference, though, is that when you're making bubbles, they're polydisperse. And so you have, all, you have a whole distribution of RI, R sub I. Whereas in a microfluidic device, that's a, a frosted fabric. It has P minus minus P. So the R is, in both cases, you have an RI and an RF for each level will, will, will shrink. Um, and <clears throat> what it depends on, um, what RF depends on is how much liquid absorbs and so forth. We know that in this case, it must be equilibrated. Surface will exchange with the liposomes until you have an equilibrium surface tension of about 0.5 millimeters per meter. So this is the thing. As and that's when you're above the phase, main phase transition temperature of the, of the liquid. If you're below that, this number becomes a larger surface tension, less than the liquid in the case. So this has been measured by um, there's a nice study at the end by David Lynch from the Duke University. <coughs> they used a micro, tapered microcapillary to, to measure this for liquids. So they, we know that this is the case. The problem with 25 is that it's going to reduce the cross pressure. So the inside pressure will be larger than the outside pressure. And so there's a subsequent compaction. So there's no difference in pressure. So um, that's why the bubbles are not in thermodynamic equilibrium. So they're in mechanic, sort of mechanical equilibrium, but in the packed state, the liquids are not in equilibrium with the mass cells or the, the vesicles. This is equilibrium at 25. So when you're down to zero, the lipid density is too high for it. So it, it actually it actually wants to push there's a chemical potential bridge between the liquid at the surface and the liquid in the, in the liquid zone. But this process is so slow because the CMC is so low, right? The residence time is inversely proportional to one over the CMC. So the higher the, the lower the CMC, which for for these liquids, it's like nanomolar. So they need to be really long for these things. The 
that makes sense? I've had this question before. Are all the snowmen around the state well, The answer is no. They're at a. They're at a. They're sort of at an energy minimum, right? But there's a there's a barrier. There's sort of here. There's a barrier between true stability. That's, that's the end, and then uh, we don't have the practical one. Okay?